All right, guys. Um, um, let's start the presentation. So, welcome to the presentation. And uh, uh, my name is Praveen, and uh, I'll be presenting in this session uh, on the topic of uh, Apache Hive Replication V3. Uh, before I go ahead, I'll, let me introduce myself. So, I am part of the Hive engineering team at Cloudera, and uh, I'm also an Apache uh, committer. Uh, my primarily, uh, you know, focus uh, area of my work actually is on the hype replication uh, uh, in cloud era. With that, um, let's get started with the agenda. So in this uh, session, I'll be covering uh, introduction to a hype replication. And uh, we'll be uh, uh, talking, uh, I mean, I'll be talking about, you know, the version one and version two, actually what we supported back then and then how it evolved to v3 and in uh, version 3 uh, i'll be mainly talking about uh, the new features uh, the application interaction model which is sort of diagram actually uh, to let you know uh, how the internal uh, functioning of uh, replication is happening and a feature deep dive uh, with that uh, uh, you know um, i'll also be discussing uh, on the performance and stability enhancement, which we have done uh, in V3. Uh, resilience and debuggability, which uh, is addressed in uh, in this particular version. So let's get started. So what is Hive replication? Um, so you know that, uh, you know, uh, given two cluster, right? Uh, let's call it source and target, right? Um, there's a database on the source cluster and we want to replicate this database on the target. The feature within Hive, which uh, enables you to do so is uh, nothing but the Hive replication. So it basically lets you replicate the database present on the source onto the target cluster. Now, um, what what does this uh, you know database uh, comprises on? Uh, basically, the database can comprise of the usual entities like table, partitions, functions, views, and uh, 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 you know constraints, etc. Right. So when we say that we replicate the database onto the target cluster, database comes along with all these entities, uh, including even the database uh, properties which user sets on the source database. Now, in terms of the functioning, there are two cycles actually how it operates internally. There is a bootstrap phase and then there is an incremental phase. First time, normally what happens on the target cluster, there's no presence of the source database. And this is the first time you do the copy. Since it is the full copy, uh, we call it as a bootstrap phase. So what we do is we do the full copy of the database on the source onto the target cluster during this cycle. The second and the subsequent cycles are called incremental. Why we have named it that way? Because this is not the full cycle. Actually, we don't need to. We have already uh, you know, copy the full copy of the database on the source onto the target cluster. Now it has evolved a bit on the source cluster. So all we need is the differential. If we copy again, then we are again in sync. Uh, I mean, both source and target uh, databases will be in sync, right? Now, whether we are going with bootstrap or whether we are performing incremental, in each of these cycles, we have two step process. And uh, you know these processes are called dump and load process. So how it, uh, if you look at it on 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 a, uh, on a higher uh, level, how it happens is you do the dump, which is basically uh, asking uh, a high meta store about the metadata of the all the entities you want to basically dump. Right? These are again the same entity which I talked about, like tables, partition, etc. Right? We gather all the information about what are these entities, what are their columns, everything together, and then we dump it to a location. We call it as a staging location. This is our step one. In a step two is the load process, where what we do is the same dumped data will read from the dumped location. And then now we will apply onto the target cluster uh, as if they have come from the users. So here it is one thing to note here would be it is not a normal copy operation what we are doing. It, it would appear to the target cluster as if these requests are coming from the end user, right? Maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, that will come eventually in one, uh, one of the slides. So how do we achieve that? Hive exposes two commands, uh, SQL commands, REPL dump and load for these two operations, which I talked about. Now, 
how did it start actually in the v1 back then uh, this was our the first cut actually there uh, hive had other commands called export and import right it it used to be used for just the bootstrap so initially what you do is you'll export the data database and then you'll import it on the target cluster uh, for the subsequent ones the incremental run which i talked about there was a product like falcon and or any other uh, you know orchestration engine has to be used which can get all the events from the e uh, event stream and then they can apply on the replica so that eventually you will be in the same state as what uh, the source cluster is now what are these events these events are nothing but the activity which is done by the user of the hive system and we capture any change in the state of the database in terms of the event and then we store it in a special table called notification log table and these listeners actually keep on listening to all these activities and they keep on capturing these events so that now we know exactly what and all has happened in the database now, what are the main uh, pain points here? One thing you might have noticed uh, by now is we are doing just bootstrap within Hive system. The incremental is happening outside the Hive system. That itself is not within, uh, you know, the Hive. So Falcon may not know that exactly what is state, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, these uh, uh, events would be in. So there were mainly two problems uh, here. There was a storage related issue. There is a forex copy problem. When I say forex copy, so what usually happens is you do an export to your local sdfs you do an import from your local sdfs so what happens is warehouse is where the data resides for any of the entities like table partition and all right from there you'll export it to your local sdfs on the look on the current cluster then you'll use some tool like dcp or so to copy this to the target cluster some in some other staging location or so Again, you'll copy from there by issuing a import request from there. So eventually what you have, you have one copy in the source warehouse location, one copy in the local SDFS, some other location, one copy again in some local location on the target cluster, uh, uh, target clusters SDFS location. And finally it arrives to, uh, you know, to the warehouse of the target cluster. And this, this actually, if you look at it, there is also a problem of unnecessary bandwidth, uh, you know, uses here. Also, this did not support point in time, point in time guarantees. Actually, uh, I'll talk about point in time guarantee in maybe uh, V two. So now coming to what we did in the V two. So V two, what happened? Uh, uh, basically, that uh, bootstrap and incremental, both this operation became integral part of the hive system itself, right? So you'll do bootstrap also, and you'll take care of incremental. So the first benefit you got is out of this. This was a this was a big jump in terms of uh, you know uh, how much control you have actually on the replication. So we have started supporting point in time consistency. What do we mean by point in time consistency? It means is we are anyway dealing with the events, right? So exactly if you if you are at a certain event on your uh, source cluster and if you map it to the same event on target cluster, no matter in future what happened to the entities, uh, but uh, even though you know the source cluster has evolved, but if we are looking at the view at that point of time, it will be exactly matching with the view on the target cluster. So that kind of consistency we started supporting with this. Now, in terms of the command, this is where we introduced REPL dump and REPL load command first time. And it started uh, capturing the data location details and all in a special file underscore files, which uh, has some, some, some sort of format uh, where we have the data uh, location. So it is not just the meta uh, metadata. It is also the data location is what we capt we started capturing the dump directly. And during the load process, we will copy the metadata and we'll also copy the data by looking at this under these underscore files, uh, you know, which would be there in various locations. Okay. So what were the main pain points at this point of time? One thing you might have noticed that these are ad hoc commands, meaning you do a dump operation and then you load uh, do a load operation. At this point of time, everything is in sync, right? But since uh, the source cluster is bound to uh, evolve, right? In terms of activities, user activities are still happening. So what eventually happens, the source cluster uh, has changed from initial state, right? So, so what will happen? We need to copy the, uh, you know, the, uh, the differential again. So we will again perform dump and load operation 
for which we will go for incremental load. So somebody has to keep on doing this incremental every now and then so that to keep the both source and uh, target in sync. This was this dump and load were two commands, but they were not sort of service or something that you, you submit a policy and then everything is uh, getting uh, taken care automatically, right? This was one of the you know main issue here. And and also uh, uh, there was no way to, since there was nothing actually related to replication policy per se, right? There is no way to you know create manage kind of things, right? So these were the pain uh, pain points actually which we tried uh, solving in V3. Now coming to the V3, uh, there are new features. I'll go to each and every feature. This is just for the listing I have uh, put up here in this slide. So uh, here uh, in this, I, I'll be talking about the cluster visibility issue, what it is the how how we orchestrate the replication policy and uh, you know how do we store the metrics and what do we store actually and how how does uh, this become useful for us um, other things like uh, atlas and Met, uh, ranger metadata replication also i'll talk in brief though it's sort of experimental thing but i will mention that uh, in the slide so so the first feature actually so before the feature let's talk about what is the line of sight problem right so normally what happens, you have two clusters, source and target, right? It's very, uh, very uh, often that uh, uh, the clusters are curbized, right? And they may be configured with the different KDCs. And, uh, you know, so basically a user on one KDC is not, uh, you know, authorized to access any of the services on the other uh, target clusters, right? So what happens? If you are do, performing an, a replication, so one thing you might have noticed that the data resides in HDFS, right? So during the process of replication, that data has to basically get copied from the source HDFS to the target uh, HDFS. So for sure, we require some sort of, you know, uh, visibility of these clusters so that they can interact with each other, right? Um, this is one problem. And second problem is uh, like uh, network accessibility, but that is like uh, since, if it is like within the on-prem deployments, then that might not be an issue. Even uh, the trust setup is not an issue uh, uh, for the on-prem de de deployment, but this can be a uh, huge uh, you know, concern actually, if you are going to support sort of uh, cloud replication, right? Where from the cloud cluster, you need to access the on-prem cluster and you need to open the port so that the uh, machine on the cloud can access it. And, Many of the organization might not find it very well. Okay, so this is the problem. And what we have done to solve this, we have come up with a way where absolute, uh, you know, absolutely there is no interaction required between two uh, clusters, right? But now the data has to still move from this cluster to others. For which what we started doing, uh, uh, you know, at this point of time, we also have, uh, uh, I mean, along with the metadata, we also dump the data. And instead of going through the HDFS directly, it will go to the some common staging location, which may be ideally maybe in a cloud system, storage system or so. And the target can basically, uh, you know, copy right from there. So one thing you might see here is there is a 2x copy problem here. But uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, given the current uh, situation, this is uh, uh, this problem will be there uh, in this. Um, you know solution uh, one one other thing is we continue to support on prem to operant uh, uh, on prem to on prem without needing this uh, staging location in some uh, uh, you know basically without uh, having this data to be part of the staging location so that way if you are still working on a on prem and you are fine giving uh, you know uh, fine uh, set up the trust setup between the source and target you can uh, you don't have this 2x copy problem actually this is just an optional feature now uh, coming to how replication basically works uh, uh, actually what and all happens so one thing what we have done is so there was no way to orchestrate uh, you know earlier right so there is already a feature called scheduled query in hive which is sort of cron scheduler so given some query, it can run on periodic basis, whatever you want, right? Here, all we wanted is that our replication can work, uh, you know, can uh, happen periodically, right? So here, what uh, we are, uh, what we are uh, doing is we are leveraging actually the scheduled query feature, right? 
so we uh, we have uh, the dump operation which we submit as a part of uh, you know scheduled query uh, on the source cluster and then we have a load operation which we submit on the right side you see the dr uh, dr uh, uh, cluster which is your target and the prod is uh, on the left side is the source so we have two queries being submitted one to the source hs2 which is the dump query one query we submit actually to the target which is the load uh, query which runs on the target hs2 right uh, uh, the internal functioning is still the same which i talked about meaning like it will uh, when the query when the query runs so uh, still it will uh, read the metadata from the hms and it will it will basically dump it to the uh, you know uh, uh, staging location on the other side when the query actually uh, runs on the load side on the target side it will read the same metadata which is dumped as a part of the staging location it will basically copy the data also uh, from the staging sorry from the source warehouse location to the target one and then it will onboard all the metadata for the entities so this is how the interaction would be now how do we submit the query uh, you know scheduled query here so uh, scheduled query uh, we submit i mean this is this is quite a old uh, you know uh, uh, query i mean i mean like it was supported even in v2 but what what is new part is you see the you know the repl dump part right so the scheduled query has two part one is the scheduled query uh, itself and the sub query which it has to run on the periodic basis right so now as i stated now we have two sub queries one the first one which you see is for mean for the source cluster which is the prod cluster i showed you the second one is for the target cluster so which is the load uh, operation so this is how you will be submitting the queries now how do we how do we get all the previously scheduled policy so you you can actually issue this request on the information schema database uh, using beeline and you can get all the queries which has been submitted so far now there was some challenge actually doing this scheduled query it was not uh, straightforward not um, uh, one thing you might have noticed that we are reusing the same uh, we are leveraging the same feature what scheduled query provides right so what is what is the extra thing which we have done was it so easy actually where you know just we had to submit two queries and uh, it would have worked even in the past no there were some key challenges here and i'll discuss about them in the uh, news uh, in uh, next slides the first problem was actually if you if you notice that we are submitting two queries right one on the prod one on the target right they can have their individual frequency so suppose there is a mismatch in the frequency right so what happens the dump is uh, uh, dump is uh, you know working on the uh, prod side the uh, load is happening on the dr side right and if they have got the different frequency what could happen is and one other fact i would like to you know state here is that this dump process and the load process is nothing but uh, it is internally it is a producer consumer model meaning whatever the dump operation produces the load operation is going to basically uh, uh, consume that uh, 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 content right so what happens is when you are doing a dump operation and you have already dumped unless this has been consumed there's no point doing another dump because you'll end up having uh, occupying the space on the hdfs right so that's where we have built uh, and and how about the partial uh, you know dumps right how does uh, uh, how does a load operation even know that this is a fully baked dump it can basically start consuming right that's where this finished dump comes and finished load uh, acknowledgement file comes into picture so what happens dump goes and uh, it does the operation at the end of uh, you know the operation it will drop in a file called finish dump in the staging directory the similarly on the load operation when the load finishes then the load operation will dump in a file called underscore finish load right uh, so uh, what is the use of this for inter uh, i mean uh, so finish dump uh, with respect to the uh, load operation and the finished load in terms of the dump operation right so if if dump sees that there is a finished dump already there but there is no underscore finished load then it it knows that it was produced earlier but yet to be consumed so what it will do is new cycle it will skip similarly for the load load will check that the available dump whether there is a underscore finished dump or not if there is no underscore finished dump in the new dump directory 
then it will skip its own cycle. That way, that's how they will synchronize. Actually, this is very. Uh, I mean, these file does not contain any content or so. These are just for doing the act management. Now, uh, uh, there was another problem from the uh, 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 for uh, supporting these commands as a schedule query. The syntax for the REPL dump during bootstrap and incremental was different. In a bootstrap case, we used to say REPL dump database name with clause, and then you give a bunch of configuration. In an incremental case, since you have to find the differential, you need to give the base ID, right? From a starting point from which you want the, uh, you are interested in the uh, uh, differential. So the from event ID used to be that way. Now the scheduled query, the problem is this is just a single query, right? Once you submit, it is submitted. You are not going to change this query, uh, you know, from uh, when you move from bootstrap to incremental so that uh, every time you have to change this query, right? Because this event ID is evolving over a period of time, right? So first thing we wanted is we wanted to have the same syntax for both of it, right? So that's where, but then the problem was, how does it know that whether it's a bootstrap or an incremental? So we started keeping track of it in one file called underscore dump metadata, where we keep what is the mode of the operation, incremental or bootstrap. We will also store the last event ID. So when the dump operation happens, it will read the last successful dump from where it will get the dumped id up to which it had dumped last time so it now knows that you know what to dump uh, as a differential so it doesn't have to even interact with the uh, you know H, uh, hms uh, sorry hs2 on the target to find out what state it is in right so now uh, with this actually we could use the same syntax now so that's how the that's how the uh, policies are submitted now now how does this uh, replication metric happen so here in schedule query, when you submit a schedule query, things will go on and it will keep on happening actually. Uh, so schedule query will keep on running as per their schedule, right? But how do we know that what is uh, what is the yield actually per execution? There's nothing, and, and this is very generic, uh, you know, query uh, uh, scheduling uh, uh, service, right? Now we have we were using it for replication uh, as a, you know, uh, we were just leveraging it uh, uh, for replication, but we also wanted to get an insight of what is happening for each of the runs when it dumps how many events or how many function how many tables it has dumped right that's where we have exposed that we capture this and uh, this is exposed via sys uh, database replication metric table where you can actually uh, submit a query you can see that you know it it contains uh, for uh, I have actually, uh, this is not the entire set of columns, only two column I have uh, put up here just because of the space constraint. So these are the most relevant ones. So you have the DB name, replication type, like bootstrap uh, on the left side, you can see bootstrap or incremental, which uh, staging directory basically it was loaded from. What was the last uh, you know replication ID actually? And on the, on the second side, you see the status and you see a bunch of start time in terms of epoch start time end time and uh, how many uh, other bunch of metrics the error log path is null here which is good because if there is a path which basically means that it has failed right so uh, in, in there are cases where uh, there are uh, re uh, recoverable error there are non recoverable error where some manual intervention is required when it is a non recoverable error then we capture what that error is and we put up in a sdfs and give that location here so that you can go and figure out uh, admin can go and figure out what that error is and what to do actually so there will be a bunch of uh, uh, you know instruction to do in what cases now atlas and meta uh, atlas and ranger metadata uh, replication uh, uh, folks who have used atlas and ranger they may know that you know so uh, atlas uh, you can have tags attached to the entities and all uh, and ranger you have uh, you know a ranger is a service uh, across the hadoop uh, ecosystem uh, provides you fine grained ac uh, access control as well as uh, uh, security uh, stuff right so you create policies in ranger where you can say that okay who who and all user can have an access to uh, so and so uh, entities right so when we create a database uh, sometimes we also have attached policies and we also have uh, you know the uh, atlas tags and all right so as a part of replication itself you have an option to uh, you know, say that, okay, uh, if there is a Atlas related metadata also, uh, bring that along uh, while doing the replication. And same way, you can uh, say that for Ranger as well, right? And the configuration what uh, extra, uh, uh, for 
while submitting the policy it will it will look alike just like normal replication policy i showed you only there are configuration extra configuration which you need to basically uh, add in order to enable this like uh, you see like include atlas metadata is equal to true you'll have to say by default these are disabled and uh, again um, these are experimental this works actually you can um, uh, try out uh, if you uh, wish to um, yeah uh, on the atlas side uh, there are limitation like you know uh, not everything like lineage information and all we don't uh, right now uh, replicate it is just uh, you know replicated to and replicated from tags uh, will be added to the entity so that you know that from which cluster this entity has arrived to uh, this cluster it will clearly say that uh, you know from cluster so and so this has arrived through replication process in atlas now uh, coming to performance and uh, uh, stability uh, so we have done bunch of performance uh, I, I i think this is not an exhaustive list uh, but i i couldn't uh, put more than this actually here i will not be talking about all of them but uh, yeah i'll uh, cover few of them uh, in this just to know that uh, just to let you know what sort of work we have done actually in these aspects so batching of partition metadata during load operation normally what happens a uh, uh, table can contain multiple uh, 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 thousands of partition in it right and earlier prior to uh, you know this version we used we have to basically onboard all this partition on the target cluster and for which we have to make hms calls right for all this partition we would have made one call earlier right so it is like a lot of hs2 to hms uh, you know interactions were happening at that point of time what we have done is we have reduced it so significantly that now we have defaults uh, we have a batching mechanism where for a batch we do just one hms call this default to 10000 uh, you know uh, size this is configurable via the configuration parameter given here so meaning like earlier if you have 100000 partition in a table you will make 100000 hms calls add as opposed to now 10 calls uh, you know after this change right this is the magnitude of the you know effect here the other one is checkpointing for incremental dump uh, uh, during ch uh, so checkpointing is a feature which is uh, quite uh, you know uh, uh, checkpointing is a feature which is quite uh, helpful in case of uh, uh, failure so what happens suppose you are doing a dump operation and you are doing an incremental dump incremental dump works on the event basis meaning the i talked about the uh, you know capturing the notification log they are nothing but the events right when we do the incremental uh, uh, incremental replication uh, when we run that uh, phase what we do is we grab all the uh, events from the uh, metadata hms and then we dump it in the staging area right now, what happens is, suppose you have 100,000 uh, events to be dumped uh, for uh, whatever reason that your maybe production system was super busy actually, and you ended up having so many events at that point of time. So nevertheless, and if it so happens that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the dump operation for some reason, it fails at say 90, uh, uh, after doing 90K, right? when the new iteration comes for the schedule, new schedule comes actually and try to uh, retry for the dump operation it does not restart from again one it will start from exactly where it had stopped last time so you don't don't lose your uh, work actually so that is kind of impact here um, the single top uh, copy task actually for all table in external table warehouse so uh, you might be aware that uh, you know both external table and managed table has uh, you know, so there are two uh, warehouse locations in uh, hive to be configured one for all the external table one for managed table of course you can go and you can change the location per table basis but this is what the defaults are now earlier what used to happen no matter where the location is we will always fire a dcp uh, you know uh, dcp uh, 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 task actually to copy the data right and uh, if you are uh, not aware the dcp is nothing but a mr job which runs in the yarn container right the more number of dcp jobs the more uh, you know uh, requirement for the yarn container will be because for each of the dcp job it also means that it will run it will require an application master correspondingly which will again occupy one of the container right now what 
what would have happened they say there are 100k again uh, you know tables in our ta- uh, sorry uh, 100k tables in external table and you f- you have to do the data copy you will end up uh, firing uh, 100k dcp jobs right and that is like huge uh, this one now what we have done is if uh, we have tried optimizing it if the tables are within the default location external table warehouse location for the entire warehouse we will fire just one single dcp and let yarn scale the way it has been configured so not that you know this way uh, you uh, i mean this way still you can have enough number of uh, en- enough amount of parallelism by having uh, you know uh, uh, the number of mappers accordingly and that will result in parallel copy task anyway right so we will not lose out on that and what we will heavily gain on is number of application master now since we are submitting just one job it will result in just uh, requiring uh, just one application master of course one uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean that that would be uh, beneficial actually in terms of the resource utilization now uh, coming to resilience and debuggability, uh, debuggability uh, we have done actually some of the work here as well um, in a in any distributed system things go wrong and uh, it does uh, it can go actually here as well and uh, what we have tried doing is we have the exponential back of based uh, retry mechanism on the failure so we tried covering all the aspect where we try to you know interact with the external system where uh, you know say certain uh, intermittent issues can uh, make the you know replication process fail right so instead of failing it immediately we, uh, we would like to you know uh, basically uh, uh, uh we would like to do a retry in those cases of course we have uh, the checkpointing coming to the rescue but it is better actually if we can complete the task in the same schedule right apart from that we we do have improved logging and uh, we have ability to tie up uh, dcp jobs to the replication short schedule i have a slide to uh, show you exactly how how does it look like so that you can get a better picture uh, you know what i'm talking about this so so uh this is what uh the detailed uh you know uh view of the load metric we started capturing right and this helps a lot uh, so if you look at the last section right the ripple stats so what we do is we 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 have the event and there are different event type like open transactions uh, uh commit transactions or uh, say alter uh, you know table event or any of these sorts right so all the activities will result in some sort of events all the events will be replayed on to the target cluster during the load operation now we want to know that which were the costlier uh, operations right this is going to give you quite in detail uh, you know uh, information about what is the uh, time taken uh, what is the top k uh, you know uh, 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 uh top k uh, event ids which took more time per event uh, type basis right so right now you see just this is just a small example i'm giving just uh, two event type there are multiple actually this is just open transaction and uh, i think there is a commit transaction somewhere uh, yeah even commit transaction on the right hand side uh, fourth line fourth line you'll see so but then in general it will be like quite uh, you know variety of event you'll see the actual operation which user could have performed okay uh, i was talking about mapping the dcp jobs right so uh, we have a replication policy the replication policy runs at its own schedule in each of the schedule it might have uh, resulted in a number of dcp jobs it would have used right now i want to track that what were the jobs which were launched by the specific policy and by ex- a specific execution right so we have come with a stat uh, script where uh, you can see the command on the top right you can pass it on like uh, this command and the second one uh, the second parameter what you see the first one is a script the first parameter to the script what you see is the policy name the second one 14711 what you see here is the execution id each of the scheduled execution which uh, which runs inside the as a scheduled query will have a schedule a unique uh, execution id this is that id and the last one is the folder name which is optional actually if you don't do this it will end up giving you two files which you see in the down one is the start one one is the csv file uh, csv file 
the csv file will give you exactly how much time each of the job has waited or you know in uh, before the launch how much time it has taken actually for finishing the job how many mappers were used what was the you know fate of the mappers like whether it succeeded or failed or so how much byte uh, it copied in these iterations right so this much detail actually what uh, you can get and you can see in a uh, uh, if you are uh, you know if you have configured your cluster in a better way or not uh, uh, and you can tune it accordingly right the other file which i have not shown because this is quite a big file is on the per job id right this will give you more detail than what uh, uh, i am showing you here right it will go to the you know each of the job a specific detail not just you know launch time and all it will be even more elaborate information right so this is what we capture as a part of this now where are uh, you know the code actually for all the features which i talked about right now they are all in the master branch of the github repo for uh, apache high project which you can uh, find out in the repo uh, the release uh, this will be on available actually uh, since it is uh, in as a part of uh, just um, master branch right now it will be available in the upcoming uh, uh, release which uh, is supposed to be like 400 so that's where you can see the you know these things uh, um apart from this uh, i think uh, that's all i had uh, uh let me know if you have any questions uh yeah these features are available in um, yeah the question is like are these features available in cloudera um, releases yes uh, these features are available in um, uh, 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 i mean except the atlas ranger uh, uh, you know feature which i talked about which is sort of experimental actually the other feature which i talked about uh, these are available in the cloudera releases uh, right now what we have okay um the next question is do we have any benchmarking numbers for uh, replication performance yes we are working on the uh, uh, benchmarking numbers and we have done uh, sort of uh, you know benchmarking on the bootstrap uh, uh, and as well as on the incremental one and uh, uh, the performance uh, i mean uh, basically we uh, i mean the doc uh, the summary actually is getting uh, prepared and it will be available very soon okay so another question is does replication handle ac table yes it uh, it does uh, and uh, uh it it fully supports the ac table in uh, in uh, if you if you remember i uh, i mean in the slide which i showed uh, uh the open transaction right that itself is coming from the uh, ac transactions right so in a ac uh, transaction case normally what happens is the event would uh, always be 
they will they they would be actually uh, you know they'll be starting with the open transaction event and then the user would have done some activity like create table alter table or add partition whatever activity user wanted to do and then the fate of the transaction which is like either commit or abort whatever would have happened right so we'll end up having uh, you know a bunch of events for that transaction so it will be like you know uh, open transaction and then the corresponding uh, uh, you know activity related events and then you'll have the commit or abort transaction accordingly so yeah this is quite supported uh, this one and and also uh, when we say that uh, ac tables right uh, uh, replication supports uh, 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 ac i mean fully transactional as well as uh, insert only both kind of uh, transaction tables uh, uh, in this case so so just to elaborate on that uh, 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 the the acid uh, transaction the way uh, you know uh, it is used in the replication the, all these events right and they are replayed uh, all these events are captured and during the incremental they are replayed on the onto the target cluster right so uh, the way the transaction would have uh, you know uh, the transaction would have taken shape on the source cluster exactly we would be doing the same thing just that instead of this coming from the user it is coming from the replication subsystem so for uh, the acid layer of hive it will look like uh, as if you know all this transaction will get open then the uh, you know the activity will be performed and then it will get committed just like as if it would have come from the uh, from the user so the replay is exactly as it would have been done by a user All right. Um, I think uh, that's all uh, uh, from my side. And uh, thank you all for joining and for your time. And uh, yeah, um, thank you. Have a great day.